And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. Uh, I'm Andrew Kraft. Uh, let's move into the brewing conflict there between Israel and Hezbollah. Well, earlier today, the Israeli military said it killed a top Hezbollah commander as part of a two-day aerial barrage that has left more than 560 people dead and prompted thousands in southern Lebanon to seek refuge from the widening conflict. Fox News correspondent Mike Tobin is in the region with more. More back and forth fire between Israel and Hezbollah as the two sides inch closer to an all out war. On Monday, the IDF significantly escalated its offensive, hitting more than 1,500 targets and causing more than 500 deaths. Hezbollah responded with stepped up attacks against cities and towns in northern Israel. Israeli leaders are now reportedly considering a ground offensive if Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah orders his forces to keep attacking. If he doesn't pull his forces back and stop shooting into northern Israel, Israel is going to commit to an air and ground war to force him to do that. The death toll in Lebanon is now at its highest since the 2006 war between Israel and Lebanon. But Israel says this time it's different, and they're relying more on precision airstrikes they say can locate and take out militants before they threaten Israeli civilians. We're talking about heavy missiles with hundreds of kilograms of warheads pointed towards Israeli civilians, and we are committed to do so as long as Hezbollah keeps fighting. Both Hamas and Hezbollah are backed by Iran, which has promised retaliation against Israel for the killing of a Hamas leader in Tehran last month. But their response to this latest escalation has been measured, calling on the international community to stop the violence. We are concerned about the repetition of disasters like those that happened in Gaza, and therefore we demand immediate intervention by the UN. The State Department is now urging all Americans to leave Lebanon before this conflict escalates further. In Haifa, Israel, Mike Tobin, Fox News. Mike, thanks so much. Uh, let's bring into the conversation to talk about all of this and more. Our friend there at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, David Daoud, he joins me. Um, David, uh, thanks for being with us. Um, definitely wanted to get you on here. Uh, I just want to put up this graphic uh, to kind of showcase and illuminate just how effective Israel has been here. This is from John Spencer. He's a chair of urban warfare studies at the War Institute. Uh, with this graphic, the military chain of command of the Hezbollah terrorist organization, Spencer says this, that Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah has sacrificed his entire organizational leadership at the orders of the Islamic regime in Iran. He says he does not care, of course, but many others should. So. It's small and it's a little difficult to see there, but that is the hierarchy under Hassan Nasrallah, the operational command, the leadership control. And what those red banners say uh, on the top of those photos uh, is essentially killed, canceled off the battlefield, the battle space, uh, taken out of the space here. Um, that's a lot. I mean, how does Hezbollah how can they keep going without all of this institutional control present? I mean, they're gone. They're wiped out. I mean, how can they, just from an organizational standpoint, continue? Uh, pleasure, as usual, Andrew. Um, well, like, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think the answer to that is that Hezbollah is not uh, an amateur uh, organization or a ragtag militia. Uh, this will set them back on their heels. Uh, uh, not just the attacks themselves, but the surprising nature uh, in, in which these attacks occurred. Uh, the intelligence penetration uh, that it demonstrates, I think, is going to make Hezbollah uh, internally more paranoid, which is going to co complicate communication between its different uh, uh, compartments. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Hezbollah is a professional organization. This is an organization that has been around for now over 40 years. Um, they will be able to replace these commanders. Now, will those commanders come with the same veterancy, the same charisma, the same uh, confidence uh, in, in, their, uh, in their followers and their, their, their underlings uh, that the eliminated commanders had? Probably not. And that will impact war fighting. But uh, Hezbollah is not down for the count just yet. Okay, yeah, that was my question. I mean, many of these uh, players that have been taken off the battlefield in these Israeli strikes... They have been a part of Hezbollah for upwards of 30 to 40 years. And you're saying they can be replaced, but the institutional intelligence that they have acquired within this terrorist framework, that's not so easily replaceable. It's, it's not. And I, I draw the comparison always to uh, 
uh, Qasem Soleimani, the former head of the Quds Force, versus Ismail Ghani. Now, if we're going to you know, uh, be fair to both of them, they're both uh, uh, worth worthy generals. Uh, they're both, uh, you know, as military men, they're both uh, uh, capable uh, generals. But as Qasem Soleimani had a an aura around him, a charisma, uh, decades of, of relationships that he'd built up. His ability to speak Arabic uh, allowed him, endeared him to Hezbollah and Iraqi Shia militias. He was able to intercede with them to tamp down uh, conflicts between the Iraqi Shia militias, you know, e egos, ego-driven conflicts by the leaders of these specific groups. But you know, Ghani, while perhaps uh, an equally uh, capable commander does not have that additional charisma, and yeah, he doesn't. You know, he doesn't. He doesn't have that additional thing that isn't just uh, you know isn't just obtained through uh, through rank, and that obviously makes the Quds Force Quds Force a little bit more vulnerable. But it doesn't set them on their heels. And I would say the same thing for Hezbollah. Okay, but I'm going to put the the graphic back up again because if mm -hmm. you have all of these people who are dead, mm -hmm. killed by mm -hmm. Israel, uh, who are in charge of waging these rocket strikes, mm -hmm. uh, they want to see Israel wiped off the map. So if they're not there anymore, is it is it one to one? Can you draw the line that we won't see as many targeted strikes mm -hmm. uh, or drones or RPGs fired from Hezbollah into Israel? Will we see less of that because there are less leaders in play? Not necessarily. We, we've seen the same tempo over uh, the past few days since these eliminations have occurred. Um, I, I think Hezbollah's considerations rather uh, than being incapable is not having the will to do so. Um, they don't want to give Israel, uh, which is already escalating, uh, an, an excuse to further intensify attacks perhaps into a ground invasion. Uh, what we're seeing from Hezbollah's posture over the past few days, which is again, a slight intensification, but not one commensurate with the hits the Israelis have inflicted upon them, is that they don't want this to go to a full conflict. Yeah. They don't. They know they don't have the ability to withstand the full brunt of the IDF, um, and so they're trying to assiduously avoid giving the Israelis the excuse to expand further than they've already expanded over the past week and a half. Um, David, you're talking about a lack of will. Where's Iran? in all of this. Uh, we know the Iranian president is in New York for the UN General Assembly mm -hmm. here. Um, is Iran leaving Hezbollah out to dry here mm -hmm. in, this, in this battle against Israel in, in the north? Or, or will they come to their side soon or not? Mm -hmm. um, look, I think it's the wrong question. And I, oh. I, I, again, this, this goes back to the relationship of Iran to Hezbollah. It's the relationship of myself to my arm. Hezbollah is an extension of Iran, and it's more most formidable extension. I think what they're doing now, after the loss of a 20-year investment in Gaza, the military infrastructure they built up there, the investment in the individual organizations, the like Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, that's vir virtually been wiped out or severely degraded. What you don't want to do then is create conditions that will lead uh, your, your most uh, capable uh, extension uh, the tip of the spear, I mean, when you think of every country Iran has gone into, be it Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Hezbollah is there to pave uh, the, the groundwork. First, you don't want to lose them. You don't want to lose your capability to continue expanding your influence in the region. So I think now where the Iranians are, they're trying to tamp down regional tensions. They're trying to walk things back because they understand, uh, at least this is my assessment of them, uh, is that if they start to enter this this fight, then this will become a regional conflict that could potentially become an international conflict that draws in the United States, in which case the Iranian regime is going to be damaged and Hezbollah will, will be lost. So I think they're trying to walk it back uh, to where a premature ceasefire can be implemented. Um, they can stanch the bleeding that is being inflicted upon Hezbollah, and they can you know, uh, absorb their losses that they've absorbed in, in Gaza so far. Is there any diplomacy happening right now from any parties in, in the region uh, with Israel, with Lebanon, with the United States? Um, and if so, who acts on Hezbollah's behalf in those negotiations? Who are their proxies and interlocutors? I think there's a difference between diplomacy and negotiations. <clears throat> okay. Sorry, and, and, and effective diplomacy and negotiations. And I think from the outset, yes, there's been talk, but has that diplomacy been effective? And as we've talked about on this show before, uh, even if a ceasefire were to be implemented in Lebanon today, 
it wouldn't be one that would satisfy Israel's very legitimate security needs to not have a terrorist organization like Hezbollah mere meters away from its citizens, especially one that has threatened its own version of October 7th. Uh, this is something that, you know, the distancing of Hezbollah from the border, the degradation of Hezbollah, this can only be accomplished, unfortunately, through military means because the organization will not willingly disarm uh, or distance itself from the border. Who's negotiating on their behalf? I think we're talking to the Lebanese, but Hezbollah doesn't answer to them. Yeah. And the Lebanese government has been trying to use for the past 11 months, Hezbollah's attacks to gain benefits for themselves uh, in different arenas, including concessions from the Israelis on border disputes. So, David, um, before we leave here, I think that's important. And let's just flesh this out for viewers. You have the nation state, sovereign state of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Within Lebanon, Hezbollah, this massive terrorist organization, mm -hmm. operates. Who's in charge? Uh, how much intermixing is there, so to speak, or is it completely separate? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about culturally, mm -hmm. religiously, mm -hmm. and within the governmental structure mm -hmm. of Lebanon, how interwoven is Hezbollah or not? Well, I mean, look, there are demographically concentrated areas, and I think, you know, the Shiite demographic concentrations are where Hezbollah predominates, uh, but these aren't necessarily countries away from, you know, Sunni or Maronite areas. Uh, Hezbollah is, at the end of the day, as far as Lebanon is concerned, uh, a legitimate organization. It is a, an integral part of Lebanon's political and social fabric. Uh, they are part of the government. In the last parliamentary elections, as I like to keep emphasizing, they won 356,000 votes. That's 150,000 more votes than the next largest party, the Lebanese Forces Party, which is an adversary of Hezbollah, it's the political adversary. But Hezbollah, as a result, because Lebanon is a nominal democracy, at least, as a say in governmental decision making. So to, you know, while Lebanon equals Hezbollah equals Lebanon is an oversimplification of the matter, to say that Hezbollah is distinct entirely from the Lebanese state or from Lebanese society is also an oversimplification and an overcorrection on the other side. There is a degree of intermixing, okay. uh, but it is not one where they are one and the same. Okay, but what if you're not a member of Hezbollah and you live in mm -hmm. Lebanon, you're an everyday Lebanese mm -hmm. civilian, mm -hmm. Uh, and you're living through this right now. What have you heard from them? I know you have sources and contacts mm -hmm. there. Yeah, sure. I, I think again, it depends on the area. It depends on the demographic. I think there's uh, so there are some who still recall who started this fight on October eighth. Yeah. Uh, there are some who, as a result of the war in Gaza, have switched sympathies. Uh, even though they may have been anti, anti uh, they may have had antipathy towards Hezbollah, especially over the, the massacres that Hezbollah committed in Syria during the Syrian civil war. You know, the Gaza war has switched their allegiances again. Uh, you have uh, some people who may resent Hezbollah quietly, but are too afraid to speak out. And you have supporters. You, you do have people who are lining up uh, behind the so-called resistance, both from among Hezbollah's support base, but perhaps also from others who uh, perceive Israel as the aggressor. Uh, and when you know when when you're when you're receiving rockets from the other side, sometimes it's instinctive. Uh, to uh, to just support the guy who's giving the person who's firing at you a bloody nose sure. uh, without recognizing that, again, Hezbollah started this fight, and had Hezbollah not done so, Israel would not be targeting anywhere in Lebanon. All right, uh, we'll leave it at that. David Dewood, thanks, uh, as always, for helping us make sense. This is complex, and this is a new phase. It's almost been a year since October 7th, and we're in a new phase of this, and we'll rely on your expertise going forward. Thanks, David.